It maybe goes without saying that manufacturing things in outer space comes with a long list of challenges. But there are some use cases, particularly when it comes to things like pharmaceuticals, where conditions in orbit allow for types of research and manufacturing that likely can't be done on Earth. Companies are building and testing prototypes, but for one startup that's already launched a test factory into orbit, the hardest part of making something in space might just be getting it back to Earth. I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called Autocruise. You simply set the speed you want to... Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two U.S. cities. As the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with humans. In this episode, we're joined by journalist Tim Fernholz, a senior reporter at Quartz. Hackers and cybercriminals have always held this kind of special fascination. Obviously, I can't tell you too much about what I do. It's a game. Who's the best hacker? And I was like, well, this is child's play. I'm Dina Temple-Raston, and on the Click Here podcast, you'll meet them and the people trying to stop them. We're not afraid of the attack. We're afraid of the creativity and the intelligence of the human being behind it. Click Here, stories about the people making and breaking our digital world. AI machines, satellite, engine ignition, click here, and lift off. Every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. It is no surprise if our listeners have not heard of space manufacturing because it is a fairly novel idea. My name is Tim Fernholtz. I'm a senior reporter at Quartz, where I write about space and space businesses. Getting things to and from space is not easy, as we will see. But in recent years, thanks to Elon Musk's reusable rockets, among other things, there has been a growing interest in actually making things in space to use here on Earth. Most of the money made in space before this is transmitting things, so satellite radio or satellite TV. But now the idea is we can make certain things in space, and because they are small enough and valuable enough when we make them in space, we can sell them for a profit on Earth. And so there are a handful of companies trying to do this, and a lot of this research was pioneered at the International Space Station, which still plays a big role in this. Yeah, what are some of the types of things that people want to make in space? I would say the number one thing that people want to make in space are drugs, uh, pharmaceutical drugs. They are substances that can be made in small quantities, but are still very valuable. If you look at how much people will pay for a novel biologic anti-cancer drug, it's, it's quite a lot. And so uh, a number of companies from big pharmaceutical companies to startups like Varda Space are trying to grow oftentimes crystals in space. The way that small molecules are manufactured is there are chemical reactions that arrange them in the way that they need to be to affect the body or to do their job. And when you do these reactions in microgravity, when you're orbiting the Earth and you don't have the force of gravity pulling everything down, these substances form in different ways than they do on the ground. There are fewer impurities in these crystals, and that makes it a more efficient place to make them than on Earth, or at least that's the theory. As you mentioned, up until now, a lot of this R&D and early fabrication work has been happening on the International Space Station, though it will eventually be shut down. So companies are busy designing and working on prototypes of what these future space factories might be like. Have you seen any of them? Any of the prototypes? Not in person, I have to admit. (laughs) I've seen a lot of pictures of them. It's not that exciting to see because what you're looking at generally is is a metal box. 
And in that box, there are some sort of robotic moving tools and pipettes and different ways to move substances around so that you can combine the right ingredients and create these chemical reactions. What's interesting is there are a couple of different models that people have in mind for how this could be built. There are some companies that are trying to actually build their own private space stations where they envision people will be in orbit doing this kind of work. And some companies are building sort of free-flying automated space factories that go up to orbit and zoom around the planet while the drugs are made and then send their cargo back to Earth with no people involved at all. And who are the players? Can you tell us about some of these companies? Yeah, the probably furthest along right now is a company called Varda Space Industries, which is backed by Silicon Valley venture capitalists. They are the folks who right now have a factory in orbit that has made a sample of a drug that's used to fight HIV and AIDS. It's called a protease inhibitor, and they are working to bring that back down. But there are also companies like Vast and Voyager Space and Axiom Space that are trying to build private space stations where this kind of work could happen. There are also companies like uh, Space Tango and Redwire, which is actually publicly traded, that are developing their own in-space manufacturing solutions. Redwire is uh, one of the companies that's excited about something that isn't a drug. They want to build fiber optic cables in space with the idea that when you make these microscopic glass tubes in microgravity, they're going to have fewer impurities than the ones made on Earth, and so transmit data even more effectively. And what are some of the challenges? I mean, that feels like there could be a very long list here, but what are some of the challenges these companies are facing? There's a bunch. On the technology side, it's the question of, can we make this stuff in space reliably? You know, drug manufacturing has to meet a lot of regulatory uh, obligations to make sure that the product is pure, that it is effective, that it does not have any surprises in it. So they need to meet, you know, the same quality of production that they do on Earth, but in space. And they need to do it in a way that is very low mass. You know, getting something to space costs thousands of dollars a pound, basically. And so you need to make sure that everything you're doing is as light as possible. There is sort of the financial side, making sure that all of this work that you do to get this special product from space is actually worth it, that people will pay more for these space products. And that's still an open question. And then the third thing that is difficult is uh, obviously going to and from space. It's expensive to fly to space on a rocket, but even more challenging is we don't have right now a very good system for bringing physical stuff back from space. Most of the stuff that we get back from space these days comes from the International Space Station on board the spacecraft that carry astronauts to and fro. Um, And that is very crowded. There's not a lot of capacity there. And so companies need to figure out, well, how can we bring back the things uh, that we're making? And that's why Varda Space is interesting, because they have these HIV drugs on orbit that they want to come back to Earth and see if they actually are more valuable when made in space. But they're having trouble getting permission from the Federal Aviation Administration, which regulates all commercial space traffic. They're actually trying to bring their sample back to an Air Force test range in Utah, which is the same place we may have seen recently where NASA brought back a sample from the asteroid Bennu. And it's sort of much the same thing. They have a little return capsule that they want to bring through the atmosphere, parachute down, and land in the desert. The challenge for Varda has been getting permission to do that. Um, It's a coordination challenge. They need the Air Force and the FAA to get on the same page, and they also need to shut down air traffic over the area so that their plummeting capsule does not hit any planes. Uh, That is top of mind for the FAA, which is worried about public safety. And there's the issue of convincing regulators on Varda's part that they know what they're doing, that when their spacecraft that they designed decides to come back to Earth, it's going to land right where they expect it to. And so far, the company has not been able to solve those two problems with government agencies. They're still trying to. They're still hoping they'll be able to bring back their first mission. But as a kind of uh, backup plan for their next mission, which is launching in 2024, they just signed a deal with an Australian test range um, where they hope they can bring it back with less red tape. 
but they're still going to need permission from the FAA. And what's interesting is because Varda is the first mover here, they're going to set a precedent that anybody else who wants to make stuff in space and bring it home again will need to obey or figure out. So it's really a, a pioneering moment for an industry that, that doesn't quite exist yet. Have the other space startups started weighing in here on this? Not yet, other than to say there is a big movement right now among space companies asking the government to spend more money on space regulation. There are only so many engineers who work for the FAA right now. And because there's so much stuff going on in space with SpaceX launching all the time and building their new rocket, but also dozens of other rocket companies trying to test out new things Varda showing up and saying, hey, can you check the math on our plan to bring back our sample? They just don't have enough people is one thing that we're consistently hearing. So they would like Congress to spend more money on the FAA to get this stuff moving. And I think that would be helpful. Has it had a dampening effect or is it too soon to know? It feels like a very long list of challenges for what was already going to be a pretty challenging industry. It's hard to say it's had a dampening effect just because it is it is too soon. It's early days. I think if in the next year Varda can't get permission to bring back its samples, that would have a dampening effect. Because if you're another company and you're looking at what's happening here, you know, you're maybe not going to spend, you know, a million dollars or more to go to space if you don't think you can bring anything back. But I do think the FAA is committed to doing this in a good faith way. And it's sort of the nature of, you know, a new industry where the government and companies are still sort of figuring this stuff out. But there are enough people interested in doing this and bringing stuff back that I think it will happen. You know, there's a company called Inverse in Los Angeles that wants to have a whole business around bringing stuff back from space. And they're developing capsules to do that. There are companies like Astroforge that want to mine platinum group metal asteroids and bring those metals back to Earth. And there's also just with uh, NASA's plan to return to the moon with the Artemis program, NASA is going to be wanting to bring back a lot of moon rocks and things of that nature. So there is a lot more momentum towards figuring out how we can bring stuff back from space, but it's not clear yet what it's going to look like. And out of curiosity, until that happens, do these HIV drugs just keep orbiting the Earth? Like what's going on up there? (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly. One of the things I asked the Varda folks was, you know, is there a time limit on this? And I guess they chose this particular drug because it has a long shelf life. They were aware that it might take them longer to bring back than, you know, an ideal world. And so they're hoping that the samples will last until they bring them back. What I heard from the president of the company last week was that it's going to be more than days and less than a year. So that is a pretty broad range, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so what are some of the different designs of these uh, factories like? Because they're pretty different. Yeah, each company has its own uh, sort of approach to this. And they're all sort of self-contained space payloads, you know, meeting, uh, you know, there are standards for the size of a payload that goes into space and how it plugs into a power system and things like that. And basically, the the two models are sort of a free-flying automated factory. So maybe it's inside of a SpaceX Dragon or maybe it's mounted on a, you know, Rocket Lab Photon spacecraft and it does its job and then it ejects the return capsule that goes back to Earth. But the other model would be at the International Space Station or at the private space stations that NASA wants to replace that with. You could see crews flying up, operating these factories. Maybe it would be simpler to have people do some of the manufacturing rather than develop autonomous systems to do it. And then they could fly back with the drugs in a spacecraft. The only spacecraft that have gotten re-entry licenses from the FAA so far have been SpaceX's Dragon when it comes back from the International Space Station and the Boeing Starliner on test flights. So 
Right now, the precedent is you need a spacecraft that is sort of certified by NASA to safely carry people, because that's the, the highest standard that you have in space world to come back into the Earth's atmosphere and land again. And we haven't quite figured out the path for a sort of automated robot that's going to do this that NASA has nothing to do with to get permission to come back. We'll be back right after this. Because you're listening to this podcast, I'm assuming you're interested in staying on top of the latest trends, news, and more. So I want to tell you about another show. It's called Web3 with A6NC Crypto, but it's really about the future of the internet, future of creators, future of business, future of the way we work and live. It's for anyone seeking to understand the latest tech trends direct from experts with high insights per minute, given your time and attention are so valuable. Follow Web3 with A6NC in your podcast app now. We have had companies, big pharmaceutical companies like Merck or Pfizer, doing experiments about drug crystallization on the International Space Station for many years. But for a bunch of reasons, including just the difficulty of going up and down to the station after the space shuttle was retired and the rules around intellectual property on the space station, we haven't really seen the promise of drugs in space. And so it's interesting now to see all these private companies trying to do it separate from the ISS and prove the business case in ways that haven't been tried before. So I guess I would say it may surprise people to hear after you know a decade plus of research on the ISS, we're still not sure what we're going to get out of drugs and other substances made in space. But in part, it's because we need more places to experiment and more time to experiment. And we're just getting the money to do that now from the private sector. Uh, how does IP or patents, how, does, how do these rights even work in space or do we know yet? On the International Space Station, which is a official national laboratory of the United States, most basic research cannot be owned by companies. They're, they've made some improvements to encourage more people to do stuff up there. But from talking to the companies involved, there's still a concern that if they invent something incredible on the space station, they may not be able to use it. Now, with private space stations owned and operated by private individuals, you don't have that problem. We haven't had specific challenges to like intellectual property laws in space. And I honestly can't speak to whether the physical jurisdiction would matter. I think in space law, it's mainly concerned with the sort of country of jurisdiction when the launch happens. But interestingly, that's not true for property rights of stuff in space. So we're still figuring out, for example, if a private company goes to the moon, what it looks like for them to own a piece of moon rock, or if a private company mines asteroids, what does it mean to own an asteroid? That is still unsettled. And we've mentioned the ISS a couple of times. Do we have an updated uh, timeline for when it's going to be brought down? Right now, uh, NASA and its international partners uh, are aiming to retire the ISS in 2030. And so the hope for NASA is that by that time, they will have privately operated space stations in low Earth orbit that they can go do low Earth orbit stuff at, and they will have places at, at and around the moon to do stuff at. But we still need to figure out what to do with the ISS, which is a very big structure in space. And if it comes back into the atmosphere, that could be a real problem if it lands in the wrong spot. So NASA has actually asked companies to submit plans to deorbit the ISS in a controlled way. Basically, they'd have to build sort of a robot that can fly up, grab the ISS, and pull it down in the right spot so that it crashes into the space graveyard in the South Pacific Ocean. Because we do not want the ISS re-entering over a populated area. That would be very bad. But we have a lot of time to figure that out. Not an obvious reason we need to pull it down in 2030. It's still pretty stable and it's still operating well. And it wouldn't be the first time that the ISS has outlived its end date. So we'll have to see how that shapes up too. The show is produced by me and Anthony Green with help from Emma Silicons. 
It's mixed by Garrett Lang with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong.